Uh, thank you. It's it's really a pleasure to be here. I've never been to Heidelberg, so it's uh, I've spent the weekend exploring, and it's been wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. And people have been very forgiving about the weather, but I actually love it. I think the colors are gorgeous, and uh, and I I like uh, overcast. We should say. I grew up in Michigan, so it feels like home. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to talk about um, some computational approaches for microbiome characterization. So although my, my lab has had um, a history of, of work in phylogenetics, and we still do a, a bit of that, um, we, we've uh, developed a couple of new pieces of software that really focused on microbiome. So I thought I'd introduce those to you uh, today and show you some of those things that we're up to. Um, but in general, my lab is very interested in method development and testing and then implementing those methods and and applying them to a wide variety of, of um, study systems. Our, our principal um, Organismal uh, study systems have been uh, crustaceans for classic uh, molecular systematics, especially uh, 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 freshwater crayfish. Uh, in German ha Germany, has a special uh, marmal crabs, weird uh, parthenogenetic uh, crayfish that um, seems to have originated through the aquacultural trade. Uh, and and been unfortunately spread around the world uh, and a, as a parthenogenetic individual it can reproduce all by itself so <laughs> it has a particular predilection for invasion so uh, we've done we've done quite a bit of work on that and then as you'll see throughout the talk um, with the microbiome work we do a lot of work in in um, human health as well and I, I, <laughs> I put up your recent paper on model test um, because it, it exemplifies my approach to software development, right? Which is um, spark an idea and a great PhD student, uh, have him do something far more uh, ingenious than you would ever figure out how to do, and then send him away with the software so I don't have to do software maintenance because the concept of software maintenance scares the living bejeebies out of me. So, all my software is stuff that's been developed in collaboration with students, and then they go away and they take it with them. And David has learned from this, uh, and now he's passed this on <laughs> to somebody else who can do better software and maintenance than we're interested in doing. So, um, so we're interested in this concept of the microbiome, and the microbiome, especially the human microbiome, are all these microbes that are in on and around you, right? And, and the trick is uh, characterizing these things. And we're interested in doing this for a number of reasons. Um, it's, it's been, uh, the microbiome has been implicated in a wide variety of diseases, in a wide variety of therapeutics, and in a diversity of organismal systems for health in general, um, including environmental health. Uh, I have a student working in eDNA, so environmental DNA using these same techniques to to uh, identify species richness in coral reefs uh, off the coast of Panama with collaborations with the Smithsonian. I actually took those slides out of this talk, but uh, I put in more disease, human disease oriented things, so we'll see some more of that. Um, so, so we really want to come down to uh, this concept of characterizing the microbiome. How do we actually go about identifying what's in a, a microbiome? And, and we're uh, doing microbiome writ large. So we're interested in, in bacteria, um, fungus, virus, archaea, everything, and even, even uh, eukaryotic parasites and things like that. Um, so in contrast to uh, what a lot of folks are doing, which is um, they, they, their focus of the microbiome is strictly bacterial species and doing 16S. So we do shotguns. So the basic concept, and this is a, a study in pediatric asthma that we're doing in collaboration with Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., where you have a bunch of sick kids come in, uh, and they have asthma, and you take nasal swabs uh, from those kids, and you sequence, uh, literally sequence the snot, um, which is kind of fun. Uh, and you get millions and millions of uh, 150 base pair snippets of DNA. And then the, the computational fun is 
okay, I've got six million little snippets per individual of uh, 150 base pairs each of DNA. What's in there, right? So it becomes a mapping exercise. And so what we do is have um, reference genomes, and we map all these reads to different reference genomes and try and figure out what's in the snot. And so, uh, as I said, the, some folks are very interested in, in, in uh, targeted sequencing. So for fungus, they'll target ITS. For um, bacterial, they'll target uh, 16S. But we do shotgun metagenomics, and, and um, at least by and large. I'll show you one example where we did 16S, and that's because of cost. There's a cost difference, right? You can do the 16S for uh, $25 a sample. Uh, the metagenomics is about $135 a sample. And if you want to do metatranscriptomics, if you want to look at the RNA and what's going on in gene expression, which I'll show you some of that as well, then the cost doubles uh, again as, well, even more than that, because it's more like $350 a sample. So the cost becomes a barrier to the kinds of data that folks collect. Um, but the information is incredible in terms of what you get uh, with shotgun sequencing compared to, to 16S, um, much closer to, to reality. These are uh, data from uh, a company that puts out some microbiome standards so you can really uh, see how your methodology is doing. And um, the, the typical approach to these sorts of things that we do is we uh, sort of write a paper on, on some methodology, so develop some, some uh, theoretical models of what's going on, and, and then we develop software uh, to implement those. So um, in, in this case, our software, our method and software are called Pathoscope. Uh, we built the software uh, to be very modular so we can um, uh, add components to it nicely. It's all uh, open source software available on GitHub. Um, and the nuts and bolts of the software is the, is the, the mapping strategy, um, which uh, our, our sort of secret sauce compared to what everybody else does, which is basically a blast kind of mapping strategy where you're just kind of mapping everything to everything. And the problem is that you have um, you have unique reads and non-unique reads, right? And unique reads map to a single genome. And so everybody else does one of two things. They either take the non-unique reads and throw them away, which means 90% of your data you're thrown away. Or they keep them in, but they don't do anything. They just map them to all the genomes that they map to, in which case you get very low resolution because most of your reads are mapping to a bunch of things. We have this reassignment parameter which allows us to take those reads that are non-unique and, and uh, have them associate with unique reads and map accordingly. So uh, the intuition here is if you have uh, reference sequences and uh, reference genomes in blue uh, and, then, and then you're sequencing reads in these different colors uh, and you've got uh, unique reads um, in purple here, some non-unique reads in green and in red, that, that with our reassignment parameter um, those non-unique reads will ride with those uh, unique reads when they're associated. And this is in a, in a Bayesian context, so you can uh, play with uh, priors and posteriors to help sort these things out when you have different unique reads mapping to different genomes, then the non-unique reads are split according to the frequencies of these unique reads. And that gives us much better resolution than uh, anybody else gets. Um, and so the basic strategy here is you take your raw sequencing reads. Um, we create a, a library of, uh, of um, reference sequences. So the, one of the other unique things about our software is everybody else uh, has a canned um, library of reference sequences that comes with the software. And this makes, uh, makes things very efficient and very nice, except that there are groups like our U.S. No, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration of the U.S., uh, there's a, they have a food pathogens lab that contributes directly uh, hundreds of sequences of new food pathogens, genome sequences of bacteria every day to GenBank. 
So if you have a canned reference library that's three years old, because that's when you downloaded the software, or that's the last time they updated the, the library, you're missing a whole lot of new data. Whereas our, our Patholib module will basically download um, everything from RefSeq today, and then you can also augment it or... Uh, <laughs> Sometimes some of the stuff in RefSeq you don't want to look at, so you can adjust it and uh, use a, a homegrown database. So we have a lot of homegrown databases that do lots of combinations. So uh, you, can, you can piece together your reference library, and the PathoMap does the mapping of, of the sequencing reads to the library, and this is done by, like all good bioinformaticians, we, when there's something useful out there, we just go ahead and steal it and pop it in, so we use Bowtie. Uh, and to do that, Bowtie actually has some issues, and we're going to try and, it, memory issues, the mapping strategy is quite nice, but the, it has memory issues, and it turns out that uh, this library gets really big um, and kind of breaks Bowtie, so we have to, we're working on replacing that. And then the patho ID is our Bayesian mixture model that does this reassignment weighting and tells us which genomes those reads uh, are mapping to, um, and we get an output. Uh, so we've we've uh, one of the things we like to do uh, because we're applying this is we we wonder, of course, whether our <laughs> methods are any good. Uh, so we do some simulation work, um, and so here we've we've used Metasim to simulate uh, data based on an oral microbiome database, uh, and. <coughs> looked at a variety of methods um, that come in some different flavors. Some do reassignment like pathoscope, some are marker gene approaches, uh, metaflan, uh, some are KMER approaches like Kraken, uh, and uh, some are genomic distances and then mapping with uh, maximum likelihood. Uh, we can look at a variety of different scenarios in terms of uh, read length, uh, sequencing depth, uh, dominance is this concept of, uh, if you imagine an infectious disease scenario where, you know, uh, you have a throat swab from somebody who has strep, <laughs> you imagine that certain species will be in very high abundance compared to everything else. So we kind of model that, uh, but then reduce that to have other scenarios where you have a more general mix of, of, uh, of microbes in the microbiome. Um, and then uh, a diversity of the number of species, and 426 is this magic number of the, <laughs> the, the oral microbiome uh, data set that's available. So that's, that's the top end of things. Um, and then looking at all the different methods, and uh, as all you uh, computational folks know, when you do these simulation studies, um, <laughs> it's this list of... of, <laughs> of uh, runs that you have to worry about, right? Because when you have 86 different things that you're looking at multiplied by trying to run the thing a few thousand times, um, you start running into problems, especially given that when you try and do these simulations, most of these methods, of course, are set up for running a single data set through and putting out some results. And not often are they very amenable to um, running thousands of data sets through at a time and compiling thousands of data sets worth of results. So this was a, a PhD student's uh, work in my lab who's now on faculty at uh, uh, Eduardo Castro Nayar, who's on faculty at Universidad Andres Bello in Santiago, Chile now. And um, what his results showed uh, is that uh, when you look at, at, uh, at the this graph uh, in terms of the false positive rates and two, true positives, um, basically you want to be up here, low false positive, high true positive. And this, in fact, is where Pathoscope is, and also Kraken and Centrifuge, so it performs pretty well compared to those. Uh, and everything else is kind of has issues in a variety of different issues under a variety of different conditions. But uh, Kraken and Centrifuge and, and Pathoscope all do uh, reasonably well. And in fact, we've even used um, Pathoscope with just the 16S data. So this was metagenomic data. We've also tested it with just 16S data. Uh, and Chime is the, the leading software uh, for analyzing 16S data. Um, but uh, 
even with the 16S data, which in and of itself has low resolution, when you're trying to get to, to species level and strain level kinds of identifications, Pathoscope with this reassignment technique does much better than Chime. Um, so, uh, and this is work actually done with my collaborator in developing Pathoscope is Evan Johnson at Boston University. And um, this is work for, from one of his master's students. Um, both these studies are, I've seen a manuscript for one. <laughs> I haven't seen the manuscript for this one, but in theory, both of them are in, in the works. So now that we have a method that we think works reasonably well, that we can trust, we're going to go back to, to our asthma study, go back to our sequence snot and see what's going on here. So um, typically this is, you've got some kid, this one happens to be mine, uh, and, and when you sequence snot, it turns out that 90% of the sequencing reads are the kid, right? And 10% and of the sequencing reads are pathogen. So when you do microbiome work, the first thing we realize is you have to be careful about what you're sampling because that proportion of host to microbe changes a lot depending on what you're sampling. In snot, it's 90 to 10. In we've, I've got a PhD student doing some breast milk. In breast milk, it's like 98% host, 2% um, uh, microbes. In fecal samples, and I'll show you some fecal data, it's like 50-50. So, so this really dictates basically the sequencing depth that you need to do uh, to get we typically target uh, two to four million reads per microbial reads per individual to, to get a reasonable estimate of, of our microbiome diversity. So you have to adjust the sequencing depth depending on what kind of material you are sequencing uh, to get the number of sequencing reads that you're interested in. So here we're interested in the pathogens, 10%. And, and again, the, the beauty of the metagenomics is in theory, you get uh, everything that's going on there. So when we, we do this, and this is in case control uh, study, so we've got asthmatics and non-asthmatics. Uh, this was a small limited uh, preliminary data set. We've got six control, uh, six cases and eight controls, and that's backwards. Six, eight cases and six controls, and then we've got um, what we found is in the cases you have this uh, thing that looks like moraxella cataralis, right, in high abundance in the cases and not in the controls. And like all good bioinformaticians, we thought, hmm, I wonder what that is, right? So I teach uh, bioinformatics and my, my mantra throughout bioinformatics course is, uh, how do you figure out when you don't know something? Do you know? What do you guys do? Google, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> so like all good bioinformaticians, we found this name, we Googled it, and it said that uh, it was an upper respiratory disease uh, bacterium. And we thought, cool. So we called our friend, uh, our collaborator at Children's National, Rob Freistadt, said, Rob, it's uh, Moraxella cataralis causing this infection. Uh, that's what we see in the cases that we don't see in the controls in high abundance. And he said, okay, how do you know it's causal? And we said, we'll get back to you. <laughs> and so we sat around and talked about it a bit. And then we realized, hey, uh, this is, in this case, we actually sequenced RNA. And 90% of the sequencing reads are from the host. So we, we did some literature searching with Google. <laughs> and we found, Google Scholar, uh, that, that, uh, that, for Moraxella cataralis, there's actually uh, was a really nice paper identifying like 87 candidate genes associated with an immune response to Moraxella cataralis infection. So we thought we have a bunch of candidate genes, we have RNA seq data, we can do a differential expression study and see what's going on with these candidate genes. And we found that that uh, like. 40 of these genes, 40 some of these genes were differentially expressed in the cases and not in the controls, uh, showing that there indeed seemed to be a, an immune response uh, going on um, to uh, this bacterial infection. So we called Rob back up and told him, and he said, all right, let's 
let's work on a paper. So the nice thing, if you can afford the, the RNA-seq data, is that when you do RNA-seq, you have this, you can look at, at the host function, what's going on there, and you can also look at the microbial function. So you can get even deeper into, into what's going on with the microbes and what, what pathways are being turned on and turned off. Uh, and, and it's really uh, 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 an amazingly rich set of data when you can do the RNA-seq, if you can afford that kind of thing. Um, one of the other nice things about this approach is that you can also, unlike the PCR approach where you're amplifying uh, known bacteria only for 16S, you can actually um, discover new pathogens with metagenomics. And this was uh, my PhD student, Eduardo, from Chile. He had worked in a molecular diagnostics lab in Chile for a few years before he came uh, to my lab to do a PhD. And his friends in Chile were uh, working with, the, they do a lot of aquaculture in Chile, especially a salmon and trout, and they had a bunch of fish dying, and they were presenting with this weird syndrome that they hadn't seen before. They had done PCR tests for all the known uh, uh, candidates for bacterial infection, and all came back negative, uh, and they didn't know what was going on, and Eduardo was emailing his friends, telling them about this cool pathoscope software, and they said, hey, can you run that on our dead fish? Uh, we said, sure, you know, send us some dead fish, and <laughs> and we'll have Adam. So we uh, ground up the dead fish and did some sequencing and applied these, these uh, metagenomic techniques. Um, it was negative for, they have a microarray detection and that was negative, PCR was negative. They found, uh, they did some histology and had seen some weird viral particle looking things but they weren't quite sure what was going on. When we did the metagenomics, um, we identified uh, a known uh, bacterial uh, infection with salmon, which was not picked up by the 16S uh, PCR because uh, in this particular strain they had mutations in the PCR site. So even sometimes when you know the bacteria, you know, still don't get it with PCR uh, because of those kinds of issues, but you do get it with the metagenomics. And then there was also a salmon alpha virus that we discovered that seemed to be new, had a different morphology and a different uh, genome. We couldn't quite get enough coverage with our metagenomic sequence to, to, to estimate the entire genome of this virus, but we, uh, we did some assembly and pieced together parts of it, and it, it seemed to be very distinct from uh, what uh, at least was available in databases. So um, two lessons from this. One, metagenomics, you can discover stuff that you didn't know about before, and you'll find it, um, and you can do some genome assembly and, and then do downstream phylogenetics and figure out what it is at least related to. But two, um, you, here you have infection that a lot of the, the, the novel syndrome, the phenotyp, phenotypic pr presentation of this disease was novel because it's actually a, a result of multiple infection by bacteria and virus. And I think the more people apply these metagenomic techniques uh, in health settings, uh, the more you're going to see that a lot of infection is due to a lot of different things. That this concept that we've all grown up with and have had throughout our medical history of a single thing, right? When you when you when your uh, daughter has a sore throat and you take her to the doctor, they they swab the throat and test for strep, right? I mean, it's a single thing. We're going to test for this. We're going to test for this. Metagenomics shows that there's probably a lot of different things going on sometimes simultaneously, and you can pick them all up. Um, using these techniques. We can also apply these techniques uh, in wildlife settings. Uh, this is collaborative. Uh, one of my uh, many different appointments is with the Smithsonian uh, Institution, the, the U.S. Natural History Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and I'm principally there because I work on crustaceans and hang out at the museum on occasion. But uh, one of the advantages of hanging out in the museum is you meet all kinds of people, including reproductive veterinarians, uh, <laughs> which is my colleague here. And, and uh, they have at the National Zoo um, interesting organisms like uh, black rhinos. And, and these black rhinos have issues of high iron load in captivity that they don't have in the wild. 
and they suspect that uh, it has something to do with the microbiome in this pathway of, of the diet uh, and obesity leading to, to iron overload. So this uh, colleague uh, approached me about doing a mi microbiome study on the black rhino. So uh, I said, sure, that sounds like fun. Um, let's compare the captive black rhinos to uh, wild black rhinos. So it turns out he has... Uh, uh, a, a veterinarian colleague at Kruger National who can um, uh, collect samples from rhinos. Uh, and, and then, of course, you have the problem of shipping samples uh, internationally, which is not a good idea. But fortunately, I have a former postdoc who's at Stellenbosch University on faculty. So we just got the samples to him, and he extracted DNA, and DNA ships just fine. So... Um, we got the DNA and then could do our sequencing. And the beauty of black rhinos, of course, for gut microbiome is there's no shortage of material, right? So you've got all the starting material you need, and then some. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we sequenced uh, from uh, cat wild and captive animals um, and characterized the microbiome using uh, metagenomics and then our pathoscope software. Um, and uh, we identified uh, differences between the captives and the wilds. And one of the interesting things here was that the, the wild rhinos, the, the captive rhinos, their gut microbiome looked basically like a horse, right? Um, and it turns out the wild gut microbiomes look very different. Uh, and so we can characterize those differences and we can make recommendations for, you know, basically developing a, a wild rhino probiotic to give to the captive rhinos, which we're working on now to, to make their gut microbiome look more, <laughs> I know, it's fun, <laughs> to make it look more like a, more like a wild rhino. Uh, we're also augmenting the study now. We've got some additional funding and, and are working on uh, increasing the sample sizes and also look at the wild rhinos we have to sample basically we only sample the wild rhinos when they're they're moving them um, from one place to another because uh, I don't know why but all I know is I've seen it, pictures of rhinos under helicopters and it looks very weird but uh, that's when we do our sampling so we it's not like we're tracking them in the wild and can do serial sampling but in captivity we can and one of the funds we have now is one of the grants we have now is to really look at the microbiome diversity over time in the captive animals and how that changes seasonally and then what happens uh, when we administer some probiotics um, but the other interesting thing is is that in the wild rhinos over half of the sequencing reads don't map to anything and so we're really stuck because it turns out that our reference database, NCBI and others like it, are very focused on human gut microbiome. And in fact, uh, a very um, Western look at human gut microbiome, because we've also done studies uh, on the human gut microbiome with, uh, associated with uh, something called Konzo disease in the Congo, and those human gut microbiomes about 30% of the reads don't map to anything as well. So even the human gut microbiome, we don't have very well characterized, in my opinion. But when you step out to weird things like black rhinos, it's, it's amazing um, how different these things are. So, so there's a long road to go in terms of uh, augmenting our reference database so that we can actually do these studies um, in more robustly to have a, a really good uh, uh, catalog of, of microbial diversity. But the fun thing about the metagenomics is that you can, you can do this stuff in the classroom uh, and you can have fun with it educationally. So we run a genomics course um, and, and I was uh, talking to my colleague uh, Marcos Perez Lozada who runs the course uh, through the CBI and, and, I, and he was talking about doing a project-based learning, you know, having the kids actually do microbiome work and I said, yeah, that'd be great. You should test the grandma hypothesis. And he said, What's, what are you talking about? What's a grandma hypothesis? Well, this is my grandma. <laughs> and I have an older brother and a younger brother. This is not us. Uh, I just stole this off the internet. I got to 
talk to my mom about I know she has one of these photos of us somewhere. But basically, mom and dad would drop us off at grandma and grandpa's over the summer for a couple of weeks so they could go off and have fun. And it turns out we did too. And as you might imagine, three little boys having fun. Um, we ended up in the bathtub at the end of the day. Uh, and grandma would soap up the washcloths and give us each a wash, good soapy washcloth. And she'd tell us to wash. And where did she... She highlighted certain areas. Where do you think she highlighted for washing little boys? <laughs> but especially behind the ears, between the toes, and in your belly button, right? These are the, the grandma hot spots, right? For whatever reason, grandma suspected that, that under normal circumstances, those, those areas would go untouched. Uh, by a washcloth. So grandma wanted us to focus on those areas and make sure we got them good. Uh, so I said to Marcos, why don't you test the grandma hypothesis? Test if there are significant differences between those grandma hotspots and other areas. He said, yeah, let's do that. So we designed a whole um, project-based learning experience for these students that, that went through the entire semester, um, starting with um, taking swabs and, and swabbing themselves, and we have IRB approval for such things. They're all consented. <laughs> all the students are happy to swab themselves. Well, I don't know if they're happy to, but they do. Uh, they've consented to anyway. Uh, and they swab the grandma hot spots of, uh, behind their ears and in their belly button and between their toes. And then they also swab control spots of their forearm and their calf. Right? So you've got control spots and hot spots. Um, they develop a, a, a lab notebook and take down notes on, on what they're doing uh, as a formative assessment in this project-based learning. They do DNA extractions, run, out, run those DNA extractions uh, out on a, uh, on, um, a gel electrophoresis. They do PCR analysis. Here, this is the one time where we do do 16S because this is... Uh, educational and turns out the our school of public health is they give us some money to do some of this to do the sequencing but not enough to do metagenomics so we're working on an educational grant that will ramp it up to metagenomics but at the moment we're doing the $25 a sample run instead of the $135 a sample run but uh, another formative assessment, they can run out their gels and see if they got DNA, they can see if they got PCR product, right? Uh, and then we put them on the sequencer and our, our sequencing facility is conveniently located down the hall so they can actually go in and, and, and watch the process of setting these up for sequencing, see the machines, they spit out the data, uh, and if you get sequence data, <laughs> that's the formative assessment, so you get an A. And then, of course, there's bioinformatics. So, so they do some bioinformatics, characterize the, the, the microbial diversity, um, and then uh, they do some statistical tests because you have cases and controls and lots of data. So they learn to do some, some R uh, and, and some hypothesis testing. And then they write up as a formative, uh, as a summative assessment, they write up um, the entire project in the end and draw their conclusions. So, what are the conclusions? Educationally, the conclusions are that uh, we did this uh, one year without the, the project-based learning, without the grandma hypothesis thing, and then the next year with it, uh, same instructor. Um, and, and there were two assignments, formal assignments, that were associated with, um, with the, the uh, microbiome work. And the students did demonstrably better on both of those assignments. Um, and they also uh, take a survey about th concepts that they were struggling with and overall perception of the course. And, and from those surveys, it was also very obvious that the students got much more out of it and had fewer uh, conceptual issues uh, at the end of the course with the project-based learning. So it really seems to help um, both in... in quantitative assessments as well as qualitative assessments of the class. But of course, the really fun thing is grandma was right, right? I mean, she, uh, these are the grandma hotspots and these are the controls and there's a significant difference between the two. And, and grandma's uh, hotspots are lower in diversity, in microbial diversity. So in fact, um, this is kind of 
reminiscent of, of kind of infection where you get lower diversity when it basically you have single species or a few species dominating the population. So um, our students need to do a better job. They need to follow grandma's suggestion and do a better job of washing those those grandma hotspots. So um, it's a fun way to really integrate um, the latest and greatest of, of microbiome science into the classroom, a perfect uh, exercise for, for a genomics class where they look at everything from um, sampling all the way through to analysis at the end. So it, it's kind of fun. In all this work, um, all, all, all this work comes down to mapping things on a reference database and as I suggested a reference database is is, is relatively depauperate. So one of the things we're very interested in and involved in is this, this Earth Biogenome Project. And the Earth Biogenome Project um, has as its goal to sequence a genome of everything. Plain and simple. And and one of the first things we tried to do as the Earth Biogenome Project is do an assessment of what's out there. Right, and one of the uh, phylogenetic uh, projects, and I understand Mark Holder has been here, and uh, Emily Jane McTavish. Um, one of the one of the projects that I've been involved with uh, in the initial round was something called the Open Tree of Life, and now uh, Mark and Emily are are co PIs on the newest NSF grant version of the Open Tree of Life, and they're making it uh, bigger and better. It's another one of these great things where you conceptualize a piece of software and have great students working on it and then run away <laughs> while they have to deal with it for the rest of their lives. <laughs> so, so um, and in fact, this phylogeny is, is, the, is a phylogeny from the Open Tree of Life, and it is a phylogeny of all of life. Um, we, it, it, you wouldn't believe it, but it has... It has, uh, the original version had over two million tips, right, for every named species. And the concept of the open tree is to take phylogenetic information and taxonomic information and map those two. And what we've done here is simply trim off all the taxa that only have taxonomic information. So the only things left are everything with phylogenetic information, which is a very small proportion of the 2.2 million species, unfortunately. But... And you can see it's fairly biased, right? So, so one of the things that uh, when I first presented this figure, um, they actually uh, did a, uh, a review article on uh, a press article on the Earth Biogenome Project in Science, and they used this um, figure uh, in Science to, to visualize what's going on with the Earth Biogenome Project. And one of the first things that the... the the PR person at Science, the science writer doing the article, asked was, where are all the bacteria, right? Because the, the bacteria are these purple things up here. Um, and she said, I keep hearing about microbial diversity and how there's more microbial diversity than anything else in the world. And you look at our phylogeny, right, and it's all uh, vertebrates, <laughs> basically, uh, and then plants and then a little bit of everything else. And, and I said, well, it turns out that the bacterial community has very stringent requirements for naming bacteria. And this are all the named species. So while there is a whole lot more bacterial diversity out there, especially represented in GenBank, they don't have names. And, and so it's, it's kind of problematic and emblematic of, of an issue, I think, with bacterial systematics. But the other question, the second question um, that the science writer asked was, when you look at all these colorings, so, so the branch colors are main organismal groups, right? Uh, bacteria, archaea, or protists, uh, plants, and fungus, and then vertebrates. But around the outside, you'll see these little pokey bits. In some places, there, there are some really big pokey bits. And those are genome sizes, right? So we've mapped onto this tree genome sizes. So when you see uh, <laughs> these, are the, these are the genome projects you want to run away from, right? And not even do, no, not go in there. Um, and you can see one of the things we want to characterize is what's the challenge of the Earth Biogenome Project. And not only that, but what's the cost? And, you know, if you think about an average human 3 billion nucleotide genome, and you think that that's what a genome is, well, you know, 
sometimes you have to cost out a little differently for certain organismal groups. Um, but within these uh, bars here, we also have uh, the status of genome sequencing. So, and this is all data pulled off of GenBank, um, actually a few different databases, but we have complete genomes in red, chromosome level genomes in blue, uh, scaffolds in black, contig assemblies in gray, and then on this outer bar are yellow bars for where there are transcriptomes available. So the second question this, this science writer at Science was asking is, where are all the genomes? I thought we had complete genomes for all kinds of things. And in fact, we don't. We have complete genomes for a bunch of bacteria. But even the human genome is not complete, right? It's just, I think six months ago, there was a publication that got it to like 97% completeness. So even the human genome, which, you know, we claimed completeness 10, 15 years ago, is still not quite there. And, and when we talk about genome science, there's a long way to go in terms of uh, completing genomes, but also completing genomes in a robust way and across the entire tree of life. So this is really our, our guiding post for the Earth Bio Genome Project is to fill this ring with at least uh, chromosome level um, completeness of genomes throughout organismal diversity. And then you have a robust database uh, where, where you can do these kinds of um, microbiome studies and really uh, have some impact on what's going on. Um, so I also wanted to show you uh, wh what we can do with this data in a, in a longitudinal context. And this is a study of a fecal, fecal microbiome transplant, right, which is just as disgusting as it sounds, and it's exactly what you're thinking. Um, where, <laughs> in this case, we have, um, these are kids. This was the first fecal microbiome transplant study in children, uh, and it's collaborated with Inova Hospitals, which is a hospital system in Northern Virginia where I live. And, and you have a bunch of kids who've been on antibiotics for whatever reason, and because of that, antibiotics knock down the, the, the bacterial diversity, uh, and that allows infection for Clostridium uh, difficilis. And so these kids have, uh, end up getting very sick because they get C. diff infection. So the concept is that if we boost their microbiome diversity, that will block the opportunity for C. diff infection. So the way to do that is fecal microbiome transplant. So we had uh, nine different kids with recurrent C. diff infection who underwent uh, the FMT, and we had a diversity of donor material, right? Uh, some got donor material from family members, some got commercial, yeah, there's a commercial company that does this, commercial donor material. Uh, it's called Open Biome, I think, or something like that. Um, <coughs> And, and interestingly, this, this study of ours came out right at the same time that, uh, <laughs> that this uh, happened, right? That somebody actually died from fecal microbiome transplant uh, because, in fact, you transplant the entire microbiome. So and because we're very new at this uh, and most people are uh, not very adept at what's going on, it turns out there's all kinds of stuff in your fecal material. Uh, and, and you need to characterize that. Uh, and if you're using 16S, you're going to miss a bunch of it. But if you're using shotgun metagenomics with a robust database, which is questionable, then you're going to see a lot of it. So here, here are all our uh, donors, um, and here are all our kids before donation, right? And you can see that the kids look very different from donors. And, and in fact, they have very depauperate diversity. Once they get their fecal transplant, they start looking a lot more like donors. And that is persistent over time. And in fact, this stopped C. diff infection. So it was very efficacious. Uh, but you do worry about um, uh, Pathogens, so we can track pathogens and look at uh, what pathogens do, what pathogens are in the donors and in the recipients, and then what happens with the recipients over time. And, and um, this is one of those things that, that you get 
taxonomic information, but you also get relative abundance information. And you can, uh, one of the fun things about, I mean, really the whole reason I show this example is because I love alluvial plots. And I wanted to show you one of these things because they're the coolest thing ever. Uh, but they show how this diversity changes over time. Um, but it's important to, to if you're going to do fecal transplant, to characterize um, pathogens. Um, and you can also look at antimicrobial resistance and the passage of resistance genes, which also happens um, with fecal microbiome transplant. So we're really at the, at the frontier of, of FMT as, as treatment options, and, and we really need to, uh, especially given uh, somebody's already died from it, we need to think a lot more deeply about how we do this and how we screen things and, and what's going on with these. Uh, unfortunately, this was a relatively small sample size because the first thing we wanted to know and the reviewers wanted to know uh, and Open Biome wanted to know <laughs> is there a difference between donor material uh, when you get it from family and friends versus uh, commercially and, and we really didn't have the statistical power to, to test that sort of thing. Um, but we're gearing up for another round of this because Innova is still um, doing fecal microbiome transplants so we're ramping up our sample sizes and uh, we'll be able to test that kind of hypothesis here shortly. The last piece of software I want to uh, quickly introduce you to is, is a spin-off of our Pathoscope software as suggested by the name Telescope. And the concept of Telescope is to, in addition to the traditional microbial components of the microbiome, viruses and, and bacteria, mainly people focus on fungus, protists, um, they're also transposable elements. And... Um, and retroviruses and things like that. And Telescope is really focused on uh, that component of the microbiome. It's specifically to identify retro elements from uh, RNA-seq data. Because one of the problems with, with, uh, with transposable elements is your genome is filled with them, right? Uh, estimates of 50% of the human genome are, are a bunch of repeat sequences that are a result of, of transposable elements moving in and out of your genome and screwing things up. And, and they're historical, so they're evolutionarily, most of them are knocked out and just hanging around in your genome. Some of them are not. Some of them are active. And when we analyze them with RNA-seq data, we can tell which ones are actually being expressed. And then we can start testing hypotheses about how their expression is associated with disease. And so Telescope allows us to do that. And this was uh, software that was uh, published last month. Uh, so it's hot off the press, this one. And the same concept of, of Pathoscope, where you're trying, you have a bunch of reads, in this case, there are any seq reads, but just like, you know, there's still 150 base pair strips of nucleotide uh, sequences, and you're trying to map them to genomes. And you have the same problem as you have some that map ambiguously and some that are unique. And so we use our same Bayesian reassignment method, right, uh, to, to, to do that. The trick here is that uh, transposable elements have certain patterns um, genomic signatures with long terminal repeats and things to, that, that uh, we've incorporated into the telescope software to really pull these things out. And then we use this uh, expectation maximization algorithm to do the mapping, to get refined mapping. But what this allows us to do is, one, identify these different retro elements that are, that are actively being expressed in the genome, and two, map them back to specific um, regions of the human genome. So here, our reference database is just a single human genome reference database, reference sequence. So we're not mapping across all diversity to try and figure out. We're looking at, at, at transposable elements and mapping back to the human genome. Um, and we've done this looking at uh, head and neck cancer. It turns out there's this thing called uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas, which has for free, um, there's a lot of paperwork involved for open access data, but once you get through the months of paperwork, then in fact, the access is opened. <laughs> and we were able to get the RNA-seq data for a bunch of uh, head and neck cancer cases. Uh, head and neck cancer has a high incidence around the world and, and high mortality rate. 
uh, human endogenous retroviruses have been implicated in a wide variety of cancers. Uh, and we have been doing a lot of work on human endogenous retroviruses and wanted to look at how they're associated with head and neck cancer. So we got 43 paired samples from the TCGA where they sequence RNA from a tumor and then neighboring non-tumor tissue. So you have tissue control and, and tumor tissue all from the same individual for 43 pairs of individuals. Uh, 43 individuals, uh, the pairs of sequences. And when you run through telescope, uh, telescope identifies 3,500 um, expressed herves. Uh, and out of those, over 1,000 are differentially expressed between the, the tumor and the, the normal and the tumor tissue. Okay, the normals are the red dots and the, I didn't even know what color that is, the triangles. Uh, are the tumor, and then um, over 800 of these are expressed uh, only in the tumor tissue. And you can see by this PCA plot that you get clear immediate separation between tumor and normal, right, just on HERV expression, which is really impressive. It, it doesn't explain a lot of the variants, but, but it gets very clear separation. Then when you do a volcano plot and look at the log fold change in, in expression, uh, um, you get some really interesting uh, human endogenous retroviruses to target. And then uh, what we're doing now, and this is, this is a work in progress, is taking these, these human endogenous retroviruses, and what we can do is map them back to the human genome, right? So this is a, a circus plot of differentially expressed herves and, and human uh, chromosomal locations. So these are all human chromosomes from one to... Uh, uh, 22 and X and Y, um, and then you can visualize all the all the um, changes in expression of these herves. So you can look at not only which herves are being differentially expressed, but f where they are physically on the chromosome, and then start associating them with candidate genes associated with uh, head and neck cancer and see how they're impacting those candidate genes. And then because it's cancer, uh, we have great colleagues at our School of Medicine who actually have labs, <laughs> wet labs, uh, not computers, uh, and they can go in and do some lab work and follow up and really uh, look at, at, do some, set up some tissue experiments where they can do causal uh, ex experimentation to show causes of these herves impacting candidate genes and, and, and causing cancer. And we can also do a, a survival analysis uh, um, uh, computation to show that with herve expression, uh, you get significantly reduced uh, survival probabilities for these patients as well. And again, we're uh, writing this uh, application up. We've, we've applied this. We just had a paper published in PNAS on lupus uh, showing very similar kinds of results, that there are a whole different set of HERVs that seem to be highly active in, in lupus. We're now looking at uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer uh, as well. Um, and HERVs seem to be very widely implicated in a wide variety of diseases. So um, the, the upshot here is that uh, we love metagenomics. <laughs> it's a rich data source for doing all kinds of fun things computationally. Uh, and, and we've been using it uh, to, to really characterize um, microbiome diversity and, uh, and um, both taxonomic and functional diversity. Um, when you have RNA-seq data, you can really uh, do a lot with these data. Uh, our Pathoscope software, we think, is, is uh, a useful and, and functional piece of software for analyzing the metagenomic data. Seems to perform quite well uh, compared to other approaches. Um, and, and of course, it's just one piece in a wide, long pipeline. You do a lot of QA, QC of data up front. We use our pathoscope in the middle and then a bunch of analyses uh, on the back end. So we also are involved in developing uh, pipelines to do all this stuff uh, in a more streamlined way. Uh, our telescope seems to open the door for uh, really looking at the retro transcriptome and what's going on with retroviruses. Right now we've been focused on HERVs, but the next step is to really branch out and see how well uh, there are a bunch of lines that have been associated with various types of cancer. So we're very interested in investigating them. Um, we're, in fact, 
writing a, we have a grant proposal due on Wednesday uh, <laughs> for updating the telescope software uh, to work with single cell RNA-seq data, which is kind of the next uh, horizon uh, to see what's going on with that. And there are a bunch of unique things with single cell data that you need to take into account that we hope to do with an improved version of telescope. Um, I always tell my, my biology students, you know, uh, th that Welcome to the new age of biology where you have to be an informatician. Uh, we've discovered that ecologists are really good. <laughs> They're data centric already, so we love. In fact, the postdoc who was working on the head and neck cancer stuff, uh, she came out of ecology and she had no problem with any of this stuff. Um, so we love the ecologists and are trying to train the rest of biology to be more like them. Um, <laughs> and, and of course our software, uh, we, we firmly believe in open source software and, and making it available uh, to everybody. Uh, I'm going to find out this afternoon how we can run it through uh, <laughs> some of your tools to see how bad of programmers we are. But we are biologists on average, so sorry about that. <laughs> But uh, we do have some proper computer scientists in the group, um, but I'm not one of them. Uh, so uh, we can see how well these go, but you know, the, the software is all available on GitHub. And then uh, we've got all kinds of folks associated uh, uh, with these different studies and, and funding and collaborations from around the, the globe. Um, one, one that I'll point out in particular is um, the right... Uh, in my neighborhood is this uh, <laughs> place called Los Lost Rhino Brewery. It's a nice microbrewery in Virginia that uh, got very interested in our black rhino study. And so they had a little coming out party when we had published our paper. And so they haven't supported us with real money, but they have supported us in kind, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's the kind of collaboration we quite like. So, uh, And that's it. Thanks so much. Appreciate your attention.